Welcome back, everybody, to episode 51 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be all about laser cooling of polyatomic molecules. And as usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. Please also note that, as always, there is a 30-second time delay between what you see as live on YouTube in between what we do. And with that, I actually have the honor of introducing our speaker today. So today we have the pleasure of hosting John Doyle from the Department of Physics at Harvard. Uh, and to quickly introduce him, John studied physics at MIT with Dan Kleppner and Tom Greathack. And he's famous for developing the buffer gas cooling method in which basically any atom or molecule or even a radical that you like can be cooled to the millikelvin regime through collisions with the helium buffer gas. John's been a professor at Harvard since 1993 and is co-founder of the famous CUA, the Center for Ultrapole Atoms. At Harvard, his group studies ultra-cold molecules for a variety of purposes, ranging from the search for an electric dipole moment of the electron to laser cooling and trapping uh, single molecules in optical tweezers to molecular fingerprinting, for example, for food flavor profiles. Uh, John's research is very innovative. As a reaction to the COVID pandemic, John's group immediately started doing experiments on how to safely decontaminate and reuse N95 masks, which has uh, grown into a new scientific consortium even. You can check this out at n95decon.org. And beyond science, uh, John's famous for hosting the very best parties at conferences and for his fondness for spaghetti westerns. So with that, John, the uh, stage is yours. Sorry, you're still muted. Yep, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to talk about uh, some of our work uh, today. Uh, I'll be, let me launch directly into it and talk, say, you know, there is a lot of research going on with coal molecules. And to kind of prove it to you, here's a list of uh, some of, of all the groups that we know of that are making cold molecules through associating uh, uh, ultra cold atoms. Uh, atoms are made ultra cold through combination of laser cooling and or evaporative cooling. And then they're brought together using some kind of uh, either Feshbach resonance or photo association or a combination of those two. But mostly I wanna point out here is that just the sheer number of groups that are doing this, right? And here are, uh, are more groups that are also working with cold molecules and ultra cold molecules. They're using different methods. Here's some of the methods shown on the left, Stark deceleration, Zeeman deceleration. There's different ways of grabbing molecules that are already formed that you get uh, from a bottle or more often now you get from uh, breaking apart some other larger molecule or having a chemical reaction actually occur in, in the cell. Um, and uh, a, a fair number of groups are do now doing laser cooling of molecules. Uh, the molecules that are listed in the dark font in black, those are the ones that have actually been laser cooled uh, so far, but there's a number of groups that are beginning work um, and some of it quite advanced at this point uh, on other molecules to laser cool. Um, and just kind of to point out, whenever there's a special issue, you know it's a field. Uh, so there's a special issue of the Journal of Molecular Spectroscopy. I, uh, the deadline for submission is September uh, on spectroscopy on laser cooling of molecules. So with all these groups, there's about 50 groups in the world working on cold and ultra cold molecules. Um, why do research on ultra cold molecules? Um, uh, is there something wrong with atoms? No, there's nothing wrong with atoms. They still have a, a, a fine place in the, in the AMO community. And one of the, you, I'm listing a, the part of the enormous amount of science that's being done with ultra cold atoms. I would like to point out one kind of uh, particular technique, which is this idea of optical lattices, which many of you are already familiar with. The idea of you get the uh, atoms here cold enough and they sit in the corrugated potential created by interference of two light beams. And not only does this uh, kind of allow you to uh, interrogate the internal level structure of these atoms very, very precisely to make the world's best clocks, but also uh, you can uh, do with atoms, do some tuning of interactions between atoms in this lattice and, uh, and do quantum simulation of uh, condensed matter uh, Hamiltonians that are hard to understand, let's say. Not to mention, uh, you can take individual atoms, make quantum computers out of them, and then study uh, physics, including beyond the standard model physics, looks for, looking for, for, for dark energy, dark matter, et cetera. 
So why cold molecules? Well, one of the trite answers is the universe is made of molecules. Uh, you know, we work in AMO physics, but having some vision and how it might connect to other sciences is, is, is a good thing, I think. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's lots of work with uh, molecules and understanding the physics of molecules in atmospheric chemistry, space, chem, uh, space uh, physics, and also in biological systems. So that explains why molecules, uh, but why cold? And one of the big reasons is simply that by getting them cold, you compress internal phase space. So unlike atoms, there's also rotational and vibrational structure um, in the molecule. And so if you have a molecule like this depicted, this is anthracene, and it comes out at an oven, uh, say at about a thousand Kelvin, that means that if I have that molecule, it's, it could be in one of uh, 10 to the 14 different quantum states because of all those vibrational and rotational modes are occupied. However, if I cool the molecule down to say around a Kelvin, then I uh, decrease the number of occupied states by about 10 orders of magnitude. And this of course gives you much larger signal to noise if you're doing spectroscopy and spectroscopy isn't driving the system between uh, one quantum state and another quantum state but it also narrows the line considerably, for example, Doppler uh, narrowing or narrowing of the Doppler uh, width, I should say. So there is a method for doing this and uh, it turns out that it can cool uh, molecules at least up to about human hormone size, which is shown in the upper right. Uh, and th this is done by injecting the hot molecule in a cold gas, the molecule bounces around and this cold gas cool down to around one Kelvin, it's a, a helium gas in this case, um, and the molecule very quickly comes to the temperature of the gas. Um, it's very straightforward uh, in, in a way, uh, you have to tune the density right. And if you're worried about, you know, where, where does all the heat go? The heat goes into the gas and then the gas goes to the surface here where it's connected to a refrigerator. And one can do this uh, in a cell, a cell, you know, a few centimeters uh, size. And in that you can also put a hole in the side of that cell and create what's called a CBGB or cryogenic buffer gas beam. And this is not a supersonic beam. It's not an effusive beam. It actually is, uh, it's cry the molecules are cry cryogenically pre-cooled and they come out in what's called the intermediate regime. And there's an actual kind of interesting bit of hydrodynamic physics going on inside the cell. And this intermediate regime, Reynolds number of about 30, leads to a little bit of cooling and what we call boosting, a little bit of, little bit of forward velocity of the beam. But this kind of method is able to produce uh, intensities or molecular brightnesses that are about two or three orders of magnitude uh, greater than previous um, uh, methods for uh, radical species. And uh, radical species are, are quite interesting. Now, it's not so obvious that this would have worked up to this size of molecule. And what you see here in the movie is a uh, classical simulation, but the, the idea uh, and of course the system is quantum, um, but the idea is simply the question is if a helium atom comes towards the molecule, the binding energy of the helium atom to the molecule is much, much greater than the temperature. So the question is how long does the molecule stay, sorry, the atom stay around the molecule? And if this time is very long, what we call it's the sticking time or the residence time of the atom, then there's enough time for another atom to come by and complete the reaction, complete the bonding of the helium to the molecule. And that would be bad because you wouldn't end up with just a molecule, you'd end up with a molecule covered with helium. Um, and so we, uh, part of the work that we've done over the past, I guess now 15 years is just to look at this. And what we saw is that we saw no sign of sticking, which means this residence time is less than a microsecond. And so it really is a very clean system. And this is the work uh, that Julia did with a molecule called Nile Red. And you see the spectrum here. Here's a spectrum of uh, trans uh, This is, These are optical spectra. And what we see is we see no sign that there's, there's any helium stuck to it. We can see no line shifts and things of that sort. And so we've worked with all these different molecules. And this is also pointing out that in my group that we've been working kind of from, you can think of from the top down and from the bottom up, right? We were really working with very large molecules for you know, a couple of decades now, but we're also working with very, very small molecules, diatomic molecules, kind of uh, physicist type molecules. And one of the points I, I'd like to kind of make is that you'll see, I think in this talk that now these two have, have finally come together. So it's really for us a special moment in time. Okay, 
So uh, I should, should mention before I go on that this fundamental question of how long an atom stays around a molecule, full quantum theory is needed. It's a huge challenge. And right now it's kind of fundamentally, it's unanswered exactly what will, uh, how long that residence time will be. So I think that's quite interesting. But if you're able to cool the molecules, what you're able to do is this very fine spectroscopy. And this makes sense for the people working with atoms in the audience. It, they, I think there's always this little bit of kind of like, yeah, so what? I mean, <laughs> because you know, with atoms, you take, you take a specter of atoms, you see these narrow lines all the time. But remember, there's all of these rotational and vibrational modes. So to get spectra like this, you need a you know, very cold beam or a buffer gas kind of setup. And in this case, what you'll see is this, spe this spectra of this is a mixture of molecules, yet you're able to identify exactly what's in the mixture because these lines are very, very narrow and they're fairly sparse. And so one can use this as, to, as kind of a molecule analyzer to do this. This is microwave spectroscopy. You can also do the this in the IR and a lot of work's been done at Jilla um, in Junier's group working in the IR to do very similar things. By the way, this also led to us uh, thinking about, you know, collisional relaxation, uh, chiral spectroscopy, again, these kind of larger molecule uh, uh, science ideas. I want to talk about something much more recent, uh, which is also spectroscopy. And what this is, uh, this is uh, submitted a couple of weeks ago. This is measuring a specific properties of, of larger molecules um, uh, using uh, a combination of old and new uh, technologies. So let me talk about this for a little bit. What, what we're interested in, and many people are interested in, is photon cycling molecules. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, just like atoms, you want a photon cycle because you can get really high, uh, high fidelity detection of internal quantum states. Right, you can put the, the, the atom into a particular quantum state and then cycle it and get hundreds of thousands of photons with very, very high detection uh, uh, efficiency. The other reason you want a photon cycle is for laser cooling. You, the photon can impart momentum. There's lots of clever uh, methods that have been in, uh, invented over the past you know, 30 years or so um, to be able to uh, take uh, atoms and bring them to uh, sub micro Kelvin temperatures through laser cooling. So we want a photon cycle for both of those reasons. And just uh, photon cycling molecules, one thing that is shared between that and atoms for sure, is that even at, in atoms, you have these uh, what we call loss channels. So typically you have some a, a ground state, maybe you have a few of them, but anyways, let's consider it a single ground state and a single excited state. And you want a photon cycle back and forth here, you have a laser tuned to exactly this frequency and so you can rapidly scatter photons. But once in a while for atoms, what will sometimes happen is there'll be this intermediate state and you'll get lost. So you get a laser to repump the atom back into this cycle. Molecules are the same. The reality with molecules is that, remember all those row vibrational states? Well, you can have leakage of the, uh, of the, of the um, states, or you can leak, leakage of the molecule, it's kind of a bad image, but you know, it's leakage of the molecule to these other vibrational states. And uh, one can quantify this leakage by what are called Frank Condon factors. So for example, in this, in this case, this, this is the V equal one, this is the first vibrational, vibrationally excited state in the ground electronic state. And it has a Frank Condon factor of 0 0.02, which means 2% of the time when the molecule de excites, it goes into this state. So that's, uh, if you want a photon cycle and you don't want to use lots and lots of lasers, you want a molecule which has got what we call highly diagonal Frank Condon factors, meaning that these, uh, these are uh, much less than one, and also they get smaller as uh, you go to higher and higher uh, uh, vibrational states. So that's the idea. Uh, for diatomic uh, molecules, uh, you want to pick a molecule which has these diagonal Frank Condon factors. And now you also need to close rotation. So what you do there to close rotation is, is a very, fairly straightforward. There's nothing that you can do to change the molecule to, uh, to close, uh, to make the, the molecule more diagonal, have more diagonal Frank Condon factors. And luckily for, uh, or fortuitously for diatomic molecules, because of the molecule ha still has this uh, major symmetry, that parity is conserved. And so if you excite from say this uh, n equal one state to the n equal zero state, it will always come back down into the n equal one state. 
Now, there's a very important subtlety about the substructure of this n equal one state. You need to remix the projections of the n equal one. Um, and that uh, was pointed out by Junier and uh, one way of doing that. And that's now been expanded uh, to other, uh, other methods for remixing those states. I won't talk much more about that. What about for polyatomic molecules? Well, uh, do they have Frank Con diagonal Frank Condon factors? Uh, can the rotational branching be controlled? I'm not gonna talk, the rotational branching is a very good question. I'm not gonna talk about that too much in this talk. We have a paper about that. The bottom line is yes, uh, rotational branching can be controlled essentially in all cases. What about the, uh, the Frank Condon factors? Well, we want to know this leakage and we wanna know it very precisely. And so what we do in this recent work is we excite the molecule with a laser doing this, this, this um, into, into this excited state. We look at the light that comes out, these dashed lines with a grading spectrometer. And what we do to enhance our signal is that we repump these states in these experiments. So we create a beam of molecules, we have the main transition, we have repumping transitions, and then we look at the light that comes out in a grading spectrometer. And so this is a combination of you know, narrow band, high power lasers with uh, old fashioned grading spectrometer. And what you can see here, this is for a molecule CaOH. You can see this is the main line, right? So now the grading spectrometer is giving you a, a, a peak height, which is proportional to the number of photons that come out. We're exciting on this main line. So most of the photons come out here in this blue channel. I should say, yeah, actually it is blue. It's the shorter wavelength in this blue channel. And then you can see that there's some light that's coming out in, in, in this channel. That's here, this one zero zero channel. There's a little bit coming out in this 200 channel. And what you can do is you can repump the 100 and the 200 and then zoom in to a much, much lower intensity. This is 10 to the minus four of the intensity here. And you can see all these little peaks. And so now we're able to determine Frank Condon factors with about 10 to the minus five accuracy, which is unprecedented using this method. Um, these numbers here, by the way, these are vib vibrational quantum numbers for these different vibrational modes in the molecule. So what have we learned from this? Well, I'll just create some tension. You have to wait till the end of the talk to, to learn what we learned from this. So that's a little bit of about uh, cooling molecules to do high precision spectroscopy. I gave you two examples of that spectroscopy, one which is very pertinent to the rest of this talk. But there are, of course, those 50 groups are doing this not for technical reasons, working with molecules, but for physics reasons. And so there are a lot of physics motivation. Um, uh, let me just concentrate first on this uh, to the left. Let's talk about this is what's called precision particle physics. Um, and I'm gonna use an example experiment that, that myself and uh, Dave DeMille and Jerry Gabriel started called the ACME experiment. And what this does, it uses a molecule to look for beyond the standard model physics. And you know it's particle physics because guess what? We have a Feynman diagram. So here's our electron and there's an electron. And then we have a, 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 you know, a single loop diagram here, which includes this particle, call it particle X. And the most generic way of writing this down is that you have a particle X and then you have this uh, T violating phase at this vertex. And the T violating phase is, is, is common. It's in the CKM matrix. Um, and it's generically thought to be, be associated with uh, beyond the standard model particles. So there it is, that's the Feynman diagram. And this particle X, it can be different things. And we just made them uh, colorful here for fun. But uh, one of the uh, things that uh, was thought would be possible is what's called a symmetric partner to the top. So we call it the stop particle. And this is what the LHC was very much built to look for. It was thought that the LHC would find the stop particle. The stop particle would solve all sorts of problems. It would also, with uh, the combination of this T violation and this existence of this particle in the TEV range would also produce an EDM. And so we went to go look for these particles by looking for the EDM because the, this, this particle causes, you know, a, a, the, the electron to no longer be uh, round. It's kind of, you know, uh, a little squished, so to speak. Uh, there's different ways of saying it, but you can think of it this way, that th this time reversal violation, this fundamental time reversal violation shows up at low energy through a time reversal violating property of the electron called an ele uh, electron electric dipole moment. 
Um, and so what does this have to do with cold molecules? What we do is we use cold thorium oxide molecules and we study the electrons that are inside and we, use, we do that because the effective electric field inside this molecule is 10 to the 10 volts per centimeter. And for the theorists on the call here, 10 to the 10 volts per centimeter is not something that you can make with you know, a battery and two, two copper plates. Uh, this is a many orders of magnitude greater than what you can uh, make in the lab. Um, so we use this natural laboratory of the molecule and then the, 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 the spectral shift we're looking for is the shift due to the electric dipole moment of the electron interacting with the electric field of the molecule. And this uh, is a kind of a little bit of a busy plot, uh, but I will walk you through it. What you see here on the x-axis is the, the uh, predicted electric dipole moment of the electron. And the y-axis is the time when an, an experiment got a result. And what you see here, this is the ACME, um, uh, ex uh, the ACME result that you, it's labeled with THO. We made two orders of magnitude improvement in the sensitivity to the EDM. Nobody has found the uh, uh, EDM of a fundamental particle. But what we've done is strongly constrain some very popular theories about beyond the standard model physics. And these theories were created in part to explain the matter antimatter asymmetry. So we have been also not only looking for particles actually at, at masses above where the LHC can reach, we were also constraining the, the, the theories that can describe the matter antimatter asymmetry. So uh, as we move to, to higher uh, to the right and become more sensitive, we interact with these other theories that haven't yet been eliminated. Uh, just, I might have skipped this. This is just saying that we are doing, looking for, we're, we're sensitive to particle masses greater than the LHC is directly sensitive to. Now, another reason, and this has actually driven a lot of the work in the field, especially with the atom association work has been quantum simulation and information. And I would put this up because this was really, uh, for me personally, an inspiration for doing this kind of work um, with putting uh, um, molecules into optical tweezers and optical lattices. This is a paper by Zoller and co-workers uh, co showing that if you take a molecule which has, this is a molecule which is a sigma doublet, it's got an electron uh, in its outer orbital, and you put it on an, opti an optical lattice, you can apply microwave fields to tune the interactions between the molecules, the dipole-dipole interaction between the molecules, electric dipole, it's very strong, and you can tune the range in anisotropy to, to study do quantum simulation of spin lattice models. More broadly, uh, you know, there's now a lot of work on uh, different molecules and different situations for doing, uh, for doing quantum simulation of uh, an interesting condensed matter Hamiltonians. It all stems from this, uh, this body frame electric dipole moment that uh, you can uh, bring out into the lab frame in different ways. And then there's, a, of course, a proposal by DeMille uh, now more than 20 years ago on uh, you have, if you have an array of molecules, you use this dipole-dipole interaction to do digital uh, quantum computation. And there's some recent papers, including by Kan Kwan Ni, a theory paper is showing that you, know, you think about it a little bit and it turns out you should be able to make very high fidelity uh, cu uh, qubit gates. But in order to do this work, you need them ultra cold. And the reason is because you want to get them into an optical lattice. You want to get them into some kind of optical array to do all of this work. Um, so uh, just quickly on the association side, here's a work also from Kan Kwan Ni's group uh, where uh, she's been able to uh, take two atoms and merge uh, two atoms that are held in two separate optical tweezers, merge them together and create a single molecule in tweezer. And so now she has tweezer arrays of single molecules um, made through this method. Oops. And did I skip? Oh yeah, and then I just skipped it. So also, uh, you know, here's, this is another uh, uh, experiment, great experiment from Jilla uh, on KRB, uh, creating a Fermi degenerate gas of, of polar molecules, again, created through this association. So what we're doing is we're doing uh, laser cooling and trapping. And this is the roadmap. It's very similar to atoms, except that you really need to start with the CBGB to get enough um, molecule brightness in a slow enough beam because the layers, laser slowing, part of this doesn't work very well. And so the first idea for laser cooling of molecules really came from DeRosa. He said, okay, choose a molecule with diagonal Frank Condon factors like calcium fluoride. Um, and that's the, now you know what that works. Ye pointed out a, a way of mixing the rotational states to, to, so you can have rotational closure. 
And then I'm just going to throw this up here. Really, things really got uh, got off to a, a, a experimental start with DeMille doing the first uh, 1D laser cooling of a diatomic molecule in uh, 2010. And that's when we started getting interested in, in doing this kind of work. We were doing something uh, related, but different before that. So in 2021, uh, so the first MOT was done by the DeMille group uh, in 2014. And then three to four years later, there were three other MOTs and it still stands uh, even 2021. There's, there's four MOTs in the world, four molecular MOTs in the world that we know of. But once the MOTs were made, uh, once MOTs were made, once you got that initial cooling to around a millikelvin, things really took off, right? And that's a very, very important point. It was very hard to get a MOT for every one of these groups extremely hard, took many years. But once they got the MOT, uh, boom, there was, uh, there was a huge amount of, of, of things that happened. So this is just for my group. Uh, this is uh, calcium fluoride work that we've been doing with the diatomic molecules. Some of this is expert stuff, some of it's not, but anyways, let me go through it quickly. One take home message, we can now see our MOTs with a naked eye. And that just kind of sets the scale. It, you know, we have 10 to the, greater than 10 to the six uh, molecules. We routinely get this all the time and we routinely get it. You can tell we routinely get it because we do all these other experiments. We were able to make single molecule arrays and an optical tweezer array. We we're able to take two single molecules, merge them and study collisions, including what we call sticky collisions. It's actually related to that collisional process that I talked about earlier. We're able to apply microwaves to tune the long range interaction of these molecules to suppress inelastic collisions. And most recently, we were able to show in our tweezers a uh, 100 millisecond uh, coherence time for these rotational qubits. That 100 milliseconds is important because the gate time for two molecules is gonna be approximately one millisecond. So this is significantly, the coherence time is significantly longer, um, even in this initial uh, experiment uh, th than uh, the gate time. So I think at this point we should uh, stop for questions before I move on. Excellent. Right? Um, thank you, John. So we have already a couple of question, questions. The first one comes from uh, Bill Phillips. He's uh -oh. asking, concerning sticking with a big enough molecule, the excitation of the molecular modes might be so complex that it takes a long time before the helium is released. Could you comment? I'd be happy to comment. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the, um, yeah, that's exactly the question. And the question is, when you have, you have all these quantum levels, you're basically, the, the atom comes in, has got a bonding energy of about 100 Kelvin, uh, the, the helium atom to the, to the molecule. And if you have a bunch of, uh, uh, of vibrational states that are, have spacings that are less than that, you can imagine the energy going in, the molecule vibrating in some way, uh, and that energy kind of moving around these different vibrations, exactly as you said, and you, they, that gets lost in the molecule, it eventually has to come back out, right? Because you have to conserve energy and momentum in a reaction. Eventually it'll come back out and the atom will pop back off. And how long that atom stays is what we call the residence time. But it is an open question, how long, uh, how long you know, that, that re what that residence time is. We can't calculate it theoretically yet, but we can measure it. We can just go ahead and do the experiment. And what we've seen so far is that for molecules up to human hormone size, um, the, the resonance time seems to be less than a, a microsecond. Um, but I would love to continue and actually try to understand this problem theoretically and experimentally for larger molecules. Eventually, sorry, eventually the resonance time becomes the age of the universe and that's called a cryopump. <laughs> There's another question about sticking. How universal are your results of sticking times below one microsecond? Can this statement be generalized beyond the particular molecule you were studying? That's a great question. I tend to generalize it because of my simple-minded way of thinking about it. And the fact that the binding energies of helium to the, the, these molecules are all about the same, about hundred Kelvin. It does vary somewhat. Um, also, I tend to, think, I tend to think about the number of modes and the kinds of modes being pretty much the same, again, up to these size molecules. And that's not completely true, right? You have, can have internal rotors and those will have different kind of motions. So it's another great question. And it, frankly, it's some, somewhat open question. So far, everything we've seen, it, it, is, it seems to work, but it may be we come up with something that, that, that doesn't work and then we'd really wanna understand why. 
uh, more methodological question. What is the Fourier transform microwave spectroscopy? Meaning where's the Fourier transform coming in and what is the method about? Ah, uh, I'm sorry, I, it would take me a lot too long to answer that question. It's, a, it's an established method, but I certainly feel the question because when I first heard of Fourier transform microwave spectroscopy, I was like, where's the Fourier transform exactly? Um, it's a fancy way of saying that you plot it versus frequency. <laughs> Could one do something about leakage to other states by putting a cavity around the molecule to make the branching ratios more favorable? I guess in some way you can imagine some cavity so that you suppress you suppress the radiation to the unwanted mode. I hadn't thought about that before. Interesting. Um, when we think about cooling molecules, can we separately cool different degrees of freedom, like rotations and vibrations, uh, and then translations? Yeah, so in the collisional method, you, it's, a, it, it's a great question. In the collisional method, just to zeroth order, everything gets cooled. Okay, that's not exactly true. It depends on, and that's a, lo a lot of our collisional work over the past you know, 25, 30 years shows that there's differences in how quickly a molecule cools depending on the vibrational spacings. Um, the rotational gets cooled very, very quickly. Now it turns out you can cool these separately through optical methods. You can do rotational pumping versus vibrational, you know, that kind of thing, and you could do that. Are there other methods available for searching for an electron EDM? How do they compete with molecular spectroscopy? Uh, uh, yes, there are other methods. So far, the molecule methods are, have produced the best uh, experimental results. And uh, there are some very good reasons for that. It not only has to do with that high electric field, but also has to do with molecular structure, which I will, I will hint at later on in the talk. Um, but there are other methods. Yep. Okay, and a final question before we go on uh, by Bill Phillips. In the early days of laser cooling, people despaired of using 20 lasers to repump molecules and never did it. Any ideas of why we were so blind to the magic of diagonal Frank Condon molecules? Uh, yeah, Bill, I think I do know. It's a great question. Um, I believe that this is one of the cases where um, the fact that all physicists tendly go to physics colloquia and not chemistry colloquia <laughs> comes in. It was merely that there is some stuff that was known and thought about, maybe a slightly different language that we weren't as strongly connected with. And I've, I've kind of uh, been humbled actually a little bit. You know, the, the, the chemists really kind of know what they're doing with the tools and their viewpoint that they have. And uh, the language barrier is there, but it's worth overcoming. Okay, thanks for this first round of questions. Okay, I'm gonna um, have a drink of water. I'll be right back. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Okay. So where am I? I by, the, by the way, I love this uh, in, in the middle of the talk questions. I, 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 it, you, you guys deserve like a prize for, for doing this. This is fantastic. Okay. So now we're going to go uh, on to polyatomic molecules. And those wondering uh, in Germany, yes, that is the Autobahn. <clears throat> and that is a real car. And that is 294 kilometers per hour. Uh, that's not me, though. So uh, first, let me start off with a piece of physics, a very important generic feature of polyatomic molecules. And if there's one thing really to carry away from this talk for the graduate students, honestly, I would want it to be this, that when you have a molecule that has orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis, it completely changes the Stark level structure of the molecule. So, here is the Stark level structure. There's a magnetic field along this direction. Here's the alignment of the molecules. Um, and for a diatomic molecule, what you're doing is you're mixing these rotational states. You have to mix these rotational states of opposite parity in order for the electric dipole to be aligned in the lab frame. 
Now, when you have orbital angular momentum, whether it comes from say a symmetric top where this methyl group is spinning around the, the axis or here what you have is you have a, 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 a bent molecule or a, a linear molecule that's in a bending mode and has orbital angular momentum along, along this. And by the way, this, the chemist used little l for this orbital angular momentum. So be careful. We also use little l for the electra, electron orbital angular momentum. Um, then things change completely. And what the reason is because this orbital angular momentum, you can create these essentially degenerate opposite parity states out of the projection of the orb, orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis. And so this level structure, the Stark level structure changes dramatically. And what you have is, first of all, you have three states. This top state here is extremely highly aligned a molecule, 99.9999% alignment pointed this way, this bottom state is pointed the other way. It's almost an ideal qubit state that also includes this zero dipole state, like the quiet state that doesn't interact with the electric field. Note also how low of a field you need to apply to get this full alignment. It's actually quite reasonable for in the lab frame. I'll just say there are a few typically metastable states, and then there's a few molecules, diatomic molecules that have ground states that have orbital angular momentum due to an electron, and these are called omega states. And this is actually the structure we use in the ACME EDM experiment. The THO molecule has this omega structure. And so we use this Stark structure to our advantage to not, not in that case, do quantum computation, but to do precision measurement. And it's very, very important for rejecting systematic errors. So there are now a lot of motivations for doing polyatomic molecules. There's uh, there are uh, uh, proposals, including from our group, about uh, why these are great for doing quantum uh, computation, quantum simulation by a number of groups. This is just a kind of a summation, but there's many different proposals now. Here's some uh, symmetric top molecules. As you can imagine, kind of chemistry that you're trying to do, it depends, it's chemistry, so you wanna work with different molecules, not just one kind. And then there's precision measurement and fundamental physics, which of course we're interested in. Um, I will just kind of expand. This is a, a plot uh, from, uh, from the, this, this publication, kind of a review. But the idea being here is that if you're looking at uh, doing quantum simulation, um, that you know here what you have is lattice filling. This is for an optical lattice. And now along this axis, the complexity of the object that's in the lattice. And what it just kind of gives you a feel that there's going to be things that you can do when the, you're working with more complex, more and more complex molecules. Um, I just want, I do want to say just a little bit about one of the motivations is particle physics. We have a proposal for uh, looking for ultralight uh, bosonic dark matter uh, using uh, uh, ultra cold molecules, uh, actually in an optical trap. And also uh, there's a collaboration for a new EDM experiment uh, that's been formed led by Nick Hutzler at Caltech uh, for look, using ultra cold polyatomic molecules um, for doing a better EDM experiment with those molecules, again, in an optical trap in an optical lattice similar to the optical lattice I pointed out for atoms that had the best clocks. So remember we had the atoms in the optical lattice and that pr pr produced a very high precision clock. Here the idea is to kind of do a clock with what we call a switch to, 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 to look for the EDM. Okay, so how did we get to laser cooling of molecules? And I thought this was a kind of an interesting, interesting um, story. So I'm gonna tell it very quickly. It really started in 2000, November, 2013 for us, Maybe people are thinking about it separately. I don't know. But for us in this, uh, this Doyle group presentation, it really were these two slides that brought it home. We were working with calcium fluoride. Remember that was that calcium fluoride molecule that um, was pointed out um, as one of the original molecules to, to laser cool. And you can see here, here's calcium fluoride and here's you know, the chemistry. This is the extent of the chemistry was that, oh, wait a second, this bond here between OH and calcium is the same. And not only that, but we, because there were chemists doing spectroscopy for fundamental reasons, we also were able to look up and see that the, the Frank-Kahnen factors for CaOH were highly diagonal, just like, like uh, CaF. And the reason was, or the insight was, oh, wait a second, if you put a pseudofluoride here, then the bonding is this bonding, this ionic bonding it leads you to these di highly diagonal Frank-Kahnen factors. So you should be able to put anything over here. Um, and then in 2014, you know, once we kind of were thinking about that, we were saying, okay, we should be able to demonstrate optical cycling. This is from the ICAP poster in 2014. 
And in 2015, we were had identified SROH. We picked SROH, strontium monohydroxide, simply because we could use uh, diode lasers uh, exclusively. It's just a technical reason. And we showed, uh, we did work and showed that the, the Frank Condon factors were highly diagonal and um, that we, or, you know, we, were, we were sure at that point it could be laser cooled. And at the same month, we asked for money from the Air Force uh, for it. And so this is how quickly these things can happen. And we, were, uh, we, were, we got uh, money to work on it. Also, there were other people starting to work on it uh, during this kind of time period around 2015. Here's uh, Tim Steinle's group starting to do spectroscopy, the kind of spectroscopy you need to do for molecules to understand the system. And it was a very important paper from Masayev and Berger saying, well, what are the kind of the, the general considerations for looking for these, uh, for these um, diagonal molecules. And then we, we, we uh, wrote a paper, uh, a theory paper, the way that we were thinking about it was these, the, you know, the CaOH, this, uh, this alkaline metal uh, oxygen, essentially optical cycling center, which you could uh, then stick uh, this radical uh, to. So these are called metal oxide radical molecules where this thing down here is a pseudofluoride, this O, radical is a pseudofluoride. So let me talk about that a little bit. So this is the idea. You have this optical cycling center, these, this, uh, this atom, which has got two electrons in the outer orbital. You have this electronegative ligand and boom, you put them together. You have an ionic bond and this outer electron, because it, this is electronegative, is, is, is pushed away. This is another way of saying that the, the bond is, um, sorry, uh, what's it called? Hybridized. And so what the idea is, and now here's our calculations, this is the electron cloud here around the calcium atom, here's oxygen and hydrogen. And the electron cloud for this, uh, for this, this valence electron is away from the, the bond. It doesn't participate in the bond. And it, and it doesn't participate in the bond when it's in the excited electronic state. And this is why, this is the insight of why these kinds of molecules are diagonal. And so what it means, it shouldn't matter what you put on here, that all of these different kinds of molecules should be diagonal. And in fact, we've identified all these different molecules for all these different scientific purposes, which one should in principle be able to laser cool. And this is just a partial list. Say things have moved quite a bit forward, you can see the dates on here are 2020, 2021, uh, about how to, to maybe move to even more complex molecules. And I guess I would point to this one here, because this will come up later here, now you're starting to think about benzene rings and calcium, you know, CaO benzene, CaO pH, things of this sort. So there's a lot of great theory, a lot of great ideas are just pouring out very fat, uh, very quickly uh, lately. Now this may all sound hard, especially for people who are, you know, like me who started working on atomic hydrogen, right? But so what? Let's just go ahead and try to do it, and that's what we did. Um, we used uh, 1D uh, laser cooling. Our first demonstration. This is for SROH. Um, here is a picture of the, the kind of schematic picture. This is the CBGB cell. You have a helium coming in, you, you, you ablate this target, you create hot molecules, they get cooled by the, by the helium gas, they come out in a beam. And then what we do is this uh, the magnetic assisted Sisyphus laser cooling. We did not invent this, this was done with atoms many, a couple, at least a couple decades ago, maybe even longer. And so the idea is that you're, 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 you're uh, do, using a combination of optical pumping and the interaction of the, the, um, the uh, atom, oh, sorry, the molecule with, uh, with uh, light forces. It's basically riding up this uh, potential hill created by the interaction of the uh, standing wave of light with the, with the molecule. And then uh, because you're getting more pumping here at the top, it kind of naturally leads to the Sisyphus type effect. Uh, and so this worked, uh, and uh, here, are the, here are the publications. Um, but the idea is here's now the laser beam in this direction, the molecular beams flying this way. And if you're cooling, then the, the beam should get compressed, the molecular beam should get compressed, and that's exactly what we see. Um, we also have now done this with a YBOH. I didn't have a date on this. Uh, sorry, this was just a couple, two years ago, one and a half, two years ago, something like that. Uh, where now we've done something very similar with YBOH. Reason we're working with YBOH is this is this uh, EDM experiment, this poly EDM experiment. We want to have a heavy atom. You need that for doing an EDM. But now we can uh, uh, we can uh, laser cool this molecule and hopefully put it in an optical lattice and get extremely long uh, interaction times with large numbers of molecules. We've created a 1D mod of CaOH, and now I'm giving you a little bit more detail, uh, you know, a little bit more scary. These are the vibrational modes 
that we repumped in this uh, in this case. There's one, two, three, four, five uh, repumpers here. Um, we're driving a typical X to A transition, uh, this typical electronic transition in these these molecules. And what you see here, uh, is, uh, this is uh, using the R, what we call an RF mot. This is something that uh, we first demonstrated in, in, in our group with Adams, uh, which is uh, switching this, um, uh, uh, sorry, hang on. Uh, the 1D RF mod was first demonstrated uh, at Jilla uh, in, uh, in the Yeager. Uh, we, did, we did a 3D version for Adams in, in our group. And uh, this, uh, this RF part of it is, remember the, the substructure, now we're getting a little bit expert here, the substructure of the N equal one level when you're trying to close rotational transition, you need to remix that, and that's remixed through switching the uh, magnetic field back and forth at a very high rate. So then we moved on. Now things get a little bit more complicated, what I call a teeny bit more complicated. Here now is a, uh, uh, a symmetric top molecule, CaO CH3, and it's got 12 vibrational modes are in play, uh, quite a few. Uh, and not only that, but you have very different structure depending on whether you have the ortho or para version of this molecule. Um, we were able to, uh, to, to essentially laser cool uh, this, uh, I always forget which is ortho and para. This is para? Uh, no, this is ortho. So this is ortho, I think. And this is laser cool, very similar to the diatomic molecules. But uh, in this in situation where you have this going on in the, um, in the hyperfine states, you no longer have, uh, you don't have a lot of help from parity. So you have to repump these rotational states. It requires a second laser. And that's what I was alluding to before. We've figured out how to reclose these, these, uh, these states, um, th these rotational states essentially in all cases, but it does require another laser. And so this worked, the laser cooling of a symmetric top um, with uh, about hundred photons scattered, cool down to about, uh, you know, around a millikelvin. So we'd like to, go and continue on this complexity idea. You know, we wanna have these, these quantum objects get more and more complex, including what are the most, the most complex uh, or the most general, which is what's called an asymmetric top. And the asymmetric top means you have uh, uh, the moment of inertia in all three axes is different. And so we have a paper, which I'll point you to about this that we think it can, can be done. Um, and there's actual separate reasons for cooling, specifically asymmetric tops. I'm just throwing them up here. If you want to do a screen grab, uh, go ahead. Uh, but you know, there's things that you can get out of a, a asymmetric top you can't get any of the way. For example, chiral molecules. If you're looking to, to uh, study chirality or fundamental inter interactions of chirality with the weak force, for example. Or you can imagine doing quantum information, quantum simulation, taking advantage of these very large dipole moments now in two different directions. And this is just starting to be thought of by theorists. So we're, we're hope, we're, there's reasons for doing this. So remember I said, what have we learned from all that molecular spectroscopy I was talking about? We were able to measure the Frank Condon factors very precisely. Well, we've learned the following. First of all, we had to understand all of these uh, perturbations. So these perturbations, these are interactions within the molecule lead to a higher Frank Condon factor than if the perturbations weren't there. You know, I don't know what else to say, then you know, where you have a pure born oppenheimer uh, approx approximation. So for example, Fermi resonance, I just wanna give you a feel for this. So we're learning something about the molecule, but we're also learning something about what's possible with laser cooling, and I'll get to that. So if the Fermi resonance is you have here, we have now two nearby uh, vibrational states that come from two different uh, vibra vi vibrational ladders. So this ladder here is the CAO stretch, this is the CaOH bend, like that. And they're close enough so that they start to share some characteristic, right? I've, just that you, you, if you want to think about it as a Feynman diagram, you've got a loop here where you've got you know, one, uh, one you know, first order perturbation theory where this is being drawn in here. There's also second order perturbation theory, which com comes into uh, a lot of these uh, perturbations. So for example, in CaOH, this, uh, this um, mixing, actually increases the, uh, the branching ratio of the Frank Condon factor by about a factor of 10 because of this mixing, the, this Frank Condon factor into the zero to zero state. So it's a, it's a serious effect. These very subtle interactions are a seriously a serious effect. There's another thing called the pseudo Jan Teller effect. This has to do with the, the uh, interaction between electronic and nuclear motion, which in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation are completely separate. So these are non-Born-Oppenheimer 
um, uh, uh, effects. Uh, there's a runner teller effect. Um, and this is the interaction between uh, nuclear motion and, and degenerate states of, uh, of, of linear molecules, essentially saying that this orbital angular momentum and uh, this projection of the, of the electron angular momentum, they're no longer good quantum numbers. You have to add those two together. So it's just to kind of give you a feel for, for, for this, that you know, what, what the different subtle interactions in the molecule are. And so here's the bottom line, right? In a sense, you know, like the real bottom line is with these diatomic molecules of the structure we've been talking about, you can scatter hundreds of thousands of photons with you know, three repumpers. And so you can just like a million photons with a few more repumpers. For this triatomic molecules, because the number of states is growing, and as far as we can tell, all states are perturbed kind of the 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus three level, that you need about 10 repumpers to get tens of thousands of photons. And this is a magic number. This is what you need to load a MOT is roughly 10,000 photons. For these larger molecules, what we're coming to the rough conclusion, it's not final, just sharing our ideas that probably we're limited to about thousands of photons for 10 repumpers. And so for a diatomic molecule, you're gonna laser cool that, you've already seen this roadmap. For a triatomic, you can use the same roadmap and we're, going to, we're doing that now, but you, know, you have some motivation to get rid of this laser slowing stage that you want, to, you want it so you're not using up all your precious photons just to slow the molecules to load into the MOT. So you have some reason for doing that. For a big uh, molecule, big MOR molecule, you really need or really want to replace those radiative slowing and the radiative cooling by something that's more Zeeman Sisyphus. Zeeman Sisyphus uses very, very few to photons. And so, uh, uh, sorry, did I say Zeeman Sisyphus? I, I didn't mean to say Zeeman Sisyphus. Ben says you need to replace it by some kind of Sisyphus type cooling of which Zeeman Sisyphus is one, uh, one of the possibilities. Also this opto uh, elect electrical kind of Sisyphus cooling that was pioneered uh, in, uh, at MPQ by um, Rempe and Zeppenfeld. There's um, some ideas we have for microwave optical um, uh, slowing. Um, and uh, I should stop very soon. So I'm gonna skip lots of stuff and just say that we have now uh, gotten this to work. This is a two-stage superconducting Zeeman Sisyphus slower. The idea is very simple. Uh, you have a, a, a molecule in the low field seeking state. It's going into this, uh, this pair of magnets. It rides up the hill, gets rid of energy, and we optically pump it to this uh, high field seeking state so that as it moves up, it loses more energy. And then we do that twice, or sorry, with two pairs of magnets. Um, and we're able to, uh, to, to slow uh, the molecule. Um, and let me just show you this. So here are the idea. Here's our, uh, our buffer gas beam source opened up. Here's our Zeeman Sisyphus slower opened up. And then we're going to make the slow beam. We're going to Zeeman Sisyphus slow it and then uh, cool and trap it with lasers. Um, there it is. It works. And here's the, the data. Just This is a very initial data for slowing CaOH. Um, there, this is our beam initially. It has a, uh, a velocity it peaked around 70 meters per second. And uh, then we were able to, to do exactly this, this uh, method as I described. And we have this, uh, uh, this now moved the peak and also we created this tail, this very low velocity tail, which we're very interested in. And it matches our simulation, which is not too much of a surprise um, because this is a very straightforward. This is really expert data, which I'm gonna skip, um, but if people are interested. Um, and I'm gonna skip this and uh, just say that we're now working on this kind of molecule. So this is CaOPH which is phenol, and we're working on related molecules um, just over the past uh, few weeks, and we've gotten quite a bit of results. And the theorists and the experimentalists uh, over at UCLA and coworkers um, have thought, well, wh why stop there? You can imagine putting this, this CAO, whatever this is, <laughs> on, onto it, which is really fantastic. Okay, so the future is calling. Uh, the future is perhaps this, you know, some kind of designer molecule in an optical lattice. I don't think the end, it, there's no longer if we can do this. I think it's, it's really a when. But then I put forward the question, what will this be good for? So theorists, uh, we know precision measurements that it'll be good for. But you know, how can you use all this wonderful, rich internal quantum 
structure to your advantage for doing say quantum simulation, quantum information? I don't know the answer to the question. Thank you. John, thank you for this very inspiring talk. Um, we have a couple of more questions and also thanks for staying on time so that we can um, discuss them. So for the laser cooling, could you attach one or more laser cooling centers to much larger objects? What do you think about using these to cool mesoscopic objects like nanoparticles? Okay, so I'll take those separately. Uh, but yeah, so you can imagine having uh, two, uh, let's say I have a benzene ring or anthracene with three benzene rings, and you have one, even two different optical cycling centers on, on the two sides. It'd be very interesting. And if they were the same optical cycling center, you immediately see, oh, wait a second, that's within a shorter than a wavelength, obviously. And so now you're going to get this kind of, you know, potentially, you know, super radiant, sub radiant uh, possible states for that. Absolutely. Um, and it's a very interesting question of how far you can push that. For something that's really big, I don't think so, uh, because things that get really big get really massive, and that's a problem. Okay, you mentioned proposals for quantum computing with polyatomic molecules. Are there important advantages beyond the larger number of states available per molecule, and what are the challenges in generating the necessary level of control? So. I'll work it backwards. The challenges are essentially the same as what we've had for even diatomic molecules. And so we know what we're always talking about, we always have single quantum state control in these molecules. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have worked it backwards. So what was the question before that? Um, uh, oh, oh uh, using- the larger, the larger number of states and yeah. what are the challenges? Yeah, so, so the what larger are the advantages and what are the challenges? Sorry. Yep. The larger number of states, the answer is, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's interesting. I don't know exactly how we're gonna use all those states to our advantage. You can imagine putting all, all sorts of quantum information into the hyperfine states, which are very well protected. It's a very general idea, um, but I don't know. And then the advantages is it goes back to that plot I was showing this very, very clean, um, very low field polariz polarizable um, uh, uh, qubit states. Now, the people doing quantum simulation um, uh, uh, theory on polyatomic molecules might be cringing because I might not be telling you why polyatomic molecules are so great for that. Um, and I don't, I don't really fully understand stand, and stand that. So I would point to, 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 they, to them for, for that answer. In the Fermi resonance, what's causing the coupling between the band and the stretch motion? Uh, essentially, there's, let me go back to it. Ah. Yeah, so it's this, um, it's basically is an, an, an harmonic terms. And I, I, you can think of that, um, you, you think of the motion itself. Oop, I think I'd be able to see you. Yeah, think of the motion itself. Right, be just because you're doing this, right? It's not, it's only separate from this, this kind of motion, this kind of stretch mode, if these are, are very well separated in energy. And that's, essentially it's kind of a version of the Born-Oppenheim approximation. But when they start getting close to, to the same energy, the, these masses are the same. So this is kind of like going like, you know, like this, <laughs> kind of like that. And so, of course, if they were degenerate, then you really would have this very complicated motion. And it's only because that these are split that uh, we we think of them, you know, to zeroth order as the um, as uh, separate quantum states. Okay. Another question by Bill Phillips: Removing lots of energy in, e.g., Zeeman Sisyphus with a few spontaneous photons seems straightforward, but it seems that you get rid of lots of entropy too, which seems less obvious. Can you comment? Bill, Bill, I think, we, I think I can remember we were in a cafe in the 80s. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, and he, he was actually teaching me about some of these concepts. So it brings me back. Thank you. Uh, no, there's very little. This is slowing. This is only slowing. So the, um, there is, there, we're not concerned about entropy at all. If we were trying to do three-dimensional cooling, that's right. And so now the question is how, you know, how much entropy can you remove per photon? you know, and get, you know, true phase space compression, but we're, we're not doing phase space compression 
We're just slowing the beam, quote unquote, just slowing the beam. It, it's extremely hard. It's the hardest part of laser cooling molecules is slowing the beam. It's not making the MOT. Slowing the beam took five years. The MOT took one. Great question, and Bill. The final question is about your final slide. On your final slide, you mentioned a project loading K atoms using a buffer gas beam source. Can you tell us more and what opportunities do you see for future applications of buffer gas cooling for atoms? Excellent. Yeah, so um, here's the, the, I'll give you the bottom line before I do the explanation. The bottom line is that um, you can use a buffer gas source for atoms. They come out very slow and they, they come out with a, in a very short amount of time. And it doesn't depend on what the boiling point is of the atoms. So if you're doing laser ablation, you can laser ablate molybdenum, you can laser ablate gadolinium, mercury, whatever it is. And the, the, you're, it's kind of an out of equilibrium situation. So you have this extremely hot gas coming off at say 10,000 10, Kelvin, and then it bounces around in the buffer gas for a millisecond, and now it's at around a Kelvin. So what this work was done, this is an undergraduate project in my lab, was to do this with potassium, was to make a potassium MOT from a, what we call a CBGB. And the idea was, is just to demonstrate how good this could potentially be, you uh, ablate this calcium, you have a beam, and now you have a, just a short Zeeman slower and you know, kind of standard MOT. And what you see here is that we, um, you're able to load the MOT, the MOT all the atoms come out in a very short period of time. So the loading time of the MOT is about 10 milliseconds. And the density, we load about 10 to the eighth atoms in 10 milliseconds. We reach about a 10 to the 11 atoms uh, per cubic centimeter. No compression is used, no 2D cooling, no other kind of number enhancement has been used. So we think this might be useful for uh, experiments where you want to have a very high repetition rate, you want a very short loading time, and you want a high enough number of, of atoms to do something you're interesting with. And it was especially useful for what we call refractory metals, ones that have extremely high boiling points. So this is one thing that we hope will be useful for people working with atoms. And we'll just have to see. By the way, we've, we've loaded four different at depth types of atoms into a MOT um, on four different days, one after another, um, because they slow and you don't, you, 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 all you do is retune the laser. It's very, very uh, straightforward. That kind of gives you an, another idea. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, final, after final question, how do you get rid of the helium then to follow up on the, the potassium story? Oh, uh, yeah, so the, the, the helium, there's, so if you, look, if you look in this, there's helium coming along the axis. So there's hel right, the helium coat flowing along with the uh, potassium atoms. Or in our case, let's just talk about calcium fluoride to answer this question. So we have calcium fluoride atoms coming, <clears throat> um, and uh, sorry, calcium fluoride molecules coming along. Uh, there's helium coming along with it, and uh, there's going to be some helium that's in your system. That being said, we have lifetimes in our latest calcium fluoride experiment of uh, of a second uh, for the mod at least. Um, uh, sorry, ODT we have a, a lifetime of at least a second for a ODT. Um, you have to worry about it a little bit. We don't worry about it very much. We have a shutter that blocks the helium most of the time that gives us that long lifetime. And then most experiments that we're interested in, we have a science chamber. So you take out of the MOT and you move it to a, a chamber which has you know, lifetime of whatever, 10 or 100 seconds. So in practice, it turns out not to be too much of a problem. Great question. Okay, thank you, John, for this very interesting discussion. And with this, uh, I hand over to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also from my side, John. This was a really cool talk and a lightning tour through everything molecules. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to announce our fourth hot topic sessions as well, which will happen on July 15th. So please, if you have anything cool and new, have a look at our website and send us your nomination by July 1st. And next week on June 17th, we will have yet another talk by Eleni Diamanti, who will be speaking about secure communication in quantum networks. If you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. You can subscribe to our email list or Google Calendar. You can follow us on Twitter as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week. 
Same time, same place. Bye.